next exciting session is Pillow Talk. How to create more intimacy and passion in your life. Our experts for this session are Dr. Pellen Batur, Associate Professor of OBGYN and Reproductive Biology at the OBGYN Women's Health Institute at the Cleveland Clinic, and also Dr. Kia Ray Pruitt, Staff Psychologist at the Center for Behavioral Health at Cleveland Clinic. Welcome, and thanks for joining us, Dr. Batur and Dr. Pruitt. Thank you, I'm so excited to be here again. Virtual, unfortunately, but it's always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you as well. I'm excited to be with both of you today. Perfect. Well, you know, ladies, women's sexual health is important to emotional and physical well-being. Today, Pandora's box is open. We will have a candid conversation about how to talk about your needs, increase your emotional intimacy IQ, and understand when you need to talk to your partner and or healthcare team. So Dr. Pretour, let's start, you know, you and I work, each other, work with each other and we see each other in the hallways. Just for our audience, tell us what you actually do first and then I'll ask you a few questions. So what's your day like? What kinds of patients do you see? What's your passion? And we'll go from there. Yeah, so I have an unusual background. I'm a, a medical doctor. I'm a board certified internist with specialty training in women's health. So I don't do the fancy surgeries that Dr. Bradley does. I don't deliver babies, but I do all things hormonal. Um, so I take care of you know, women who really have a lot of trouble um, tolerating contraceptives, uh, where it impacts their sex drive, uh, um, women who are going through perimenopause and menopause and having a hard time. And I also lead the sexual health program for our OBGYN department. So anything that feels off feels like your hormones are off. That's usually what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day practice. And I would say at least a quarter of my patients are coming in for some sort of concerns related to sexual health, whether it be pain or libido concerns. Excellent, excellent. So I'll get to Dr. Pruitt in a moment, but let's just, actually let's go with Dr. Pruitt for just a moment. Just tell me a little bit about you. I know you're here and you're new at the Cleveland Clinic. What's your practice like? What kinds of patients and problems do you like to see? And we'll talk later about how to get in contact with both of you if appointments are needed. So tell us sure. more. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. So um, I've been with Cleveland Clinic for just over six months now. Um, I have a background in psychology, so my doctorate is in psychology, but I've also worked with youth and families and educational settings. Um, my current practice, um, I actually see individuals, adult individuals um, in our mental health, um, behavioral health center, um, and I see couples. So um, the couples work is really exciting. Um, you know, couples come in with a lot of different issues. Oftentimes it's related to communication, which is this big umbrella, um, but typically it's related to specific issues such as uh, rebuilding trust or um, disagreements related to finances or parenting. So, um, so I see a lot of couples in the clinic and then I also see individuals um, who are coming in with depression, anxiety related disorders and trauma. Excellent. So we'll get to many of those um points because they do affect our sexuality and our sexual well-being. So thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Pruitt. So let me get back first with Dr. Batur. And we've got a couple of questions that came in or patients have put little notes in my pocket to say, please ask this question. We hear this session's coming up. So many patients have, have asked, like, you know, when they talk with their friends, it seems like their friends have no issues with their sex life. Their sex life is so great. But the patient themselves say that they're always nervous about uh, bringing this issue up with their sex life with anyone. Is that normal? And if not, how can we help patients to comfortably talk with their provider about their sexuality? Yeah, it's a great question. If there's one major takeaway, I'd like you know our um, you know attendees to take back home. It's how common sexual health concerns are amongst women. Um, in fact, one out of two women in the United States have some sort of concerns about their sexual health, and about one out of eight. It's very very distressing. 
about one out of five are actually having painful intercourse and they're suffering in silence. So these are some of the things that oftentimes, even with your dearest of friends, people may feel embarrassed to bring up. So oftentimes women come into my um, practice, you know, feeling that their sexual health is down here and that everybody else is up here because either they're comparing themselves to their best self or to a bragging friend or to, uh, you know, Hollywood or porn. And that's just not the reality for most women. And a lot of what I do is just talking about what's normal and what's not. And we frankly do a terrible job educating women about sexuality and educating also doctors, nurses, you know, nurse practitioners, um, I do all the teaching for on sexual health for our Case Western and Cleveland Clinic medical students, and they get in about an hour from me, and then they're off to rescue the world from their sexual woes. You know, so I just think it's really important to know that there are treatment options. Um, you don't have to suffer in silence. You should bring it up, and many women are bringing up to their doctor. The one thing I would say is sometimes women bring up things and feel like they've been blown off, and it's because they've already um, brought up you know, they're there for their annual 15, 20 minute, 30 minute visit. And they are also talking about bleeding issues and this and that. Bring it up. But you, your doctor may want to have a dedicated visit to discuss it because it does take time to sort through the concerns. And so don't feel like things have been blown off or that you feel off. Make a dedicated visit to discuss with your doctor Sounds or great. your health care provider. Sounds great. So maybe before we get to what's abnormal, what is a normal sexual relationship like? Yeah. And the thing is, Whatever's happening between two consenting adults is frankly normal, right? Because a lot of times people think, oh, this isn't normal, that isn't normal. So some of the things that I like to bring up, for example, about nine out of 10 women in a healthy long-term relationship have something called a responsive desire as opposed to spontaneous desire mostly. So what does that mean? Well, I really don't have any interest in sex because I have a lot on my to-do list. Like I get through the laundry. There's this Netflix show I've been meaning to watch. And my partner, you know, wants to get together. And I'm thinking, oh, not right now. Um, and, but I'm going to go ahead and take one for the team because I know it's important for the relationship and my partner. And five, ten minutes into it, I may still be cold. But ten minutes later, maybe I'm into it and I'm thinking, oh, this is actually kind of fun. I may or may not orgasm. And I think, geez, why don't I want to do this more often? But the next time more often comes around... You know, it's again, laundry or Netflix is higher on the priority list. So if you always, you know, wait till you really want to go work out to go to the gym, you're re really never going to get to the gym, right? right? So sometimes just normalizing things that, okay, wait a minute, my body's response. So maybe I wasn't interested initially. But my body, body is responding to the cues, so my circuitry is working. And just knowing that that's normal responsive desire that 9 out of 10 women have in a healthy relationship is actually therapeutic in itself. And a lot of times it's not about the medication pills and the hormones that we have to offer it's just normalizing what you thought was completely abnormal great let me switch for just a moment and pivot to dr. Pruitt for just a moment to keep in that same frame for you as um, someone who's seen couples what do you see as healthy normal relationships you know we have many young women looking at the program uh, maybe mothers grandmothers aunties that are watching who may know some of the partners um, that our daughters um, or nieces may be looking at to date or in relationships with, including marriage. When you see a couple that has a strong, healthy relationship, mm -hmm. whether we want to use the term normal, I don't know if that's right, what do you see as sort of bullet points or factors that really make that relationship normal that then leads to healthy sexual function as Dr. Batour is talking about? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I actually have this conversation, not just with couples, but with the individual patients that I work with as well. Um, oftentimes, people really don't know what a healthy relationship looks like. But for those who do have a healthy re relationship, even if they're coming in for couples therapy um, to, to work on some issues, um, you know, some of the key elements is mutual respect for one another. So um, treating one another with kindness, um, you know, being compassionate towards one another. Also, 
having shared values. Oftentimes we hear opposites attract, but actually research shows that people who have more similar values actually stay together. So um, if you both believe in some of the same things, maybe it's a religious uh, faith that you share, uh, maybe it's your dreams for your future or for your family, uh, maybe it's your work ethic, but, but having those shared values actually helps people to stay in, um, in healthy relationships. Also being able to work through conflict. Um, so being able to talk through situations. Um, some people say that they don't like to argue in front of their kids, um, but sometimes having a healthy argument, you know, as long as people are, as long as you're working through the conflict and you're hearing out one another and you're actually able to come to some type of resolve or solution can actually be a healthy thing for your kids to see because they're able to see you work through situations and difficulties. Um, also, just being able to share one another's dreams and be supportive of one another are also some of the things that we see in healthy relationships. Those are all great um, clinical pearls that I think our viewers can, can watch, and we'll summarize a little bit more of that again towards the end. Let's go back with Dr. Batur, as we've heard of normal and um, both from you and from Dr. Pruitt. Tell me what's kind of for sexual functioning, the kind of abnormalities that you're seeing, and then we'll dive into how we might um, help those patients. So what kind of abnormal sexual issues might our patients come to you for? One of the biggest ones is pain. Uh, women come in saying, I don't know, they, they come in oftentimes saying, I don't want to have sex. And when you drill down into it, because I have this nice questionnaire where I look at any kind of factor, you know, um, you know, your body image concerns, the stress in your life, pain, and all of those factors, medications. And so it's easy for me to, you know, sift through things. And if there's pain, it's, there's nobody that's going to sign up for, you know, want to have sex if there's pain. That needs to be addressed first and foremost, because there are so many treatable causes of pain and they're not always fancy exotic surgeries i mean outside of large cysts or fibroids or things that might be getting in the way a lot of the pain syndromes that i see are hormonal for example the lack of estrogen after menopause you know you can direct hormonal th therapy straight to the vagina without it going to the breast or heart or other places so it's not system a systemic therapy um, but that can make all the difference in the world and about one out of two of our postmenopausal women are suffering in silence with dryness and pain after menopause. Um, and in fact, it's probably a little bit more than that. Um, and also what we see a lot of is pelvic floor dysfunction, which is really not very well recognized. Um, the muscles in the pelvis are kind of like a hammock that attach to our back and our hips. And just like we can hold our tension in our neck or in our back, we can hold our tension in the pelvis pelvic floor. And um, during my exam, oftentimes I'll just insert one finger and push on the different muscles gently and women are jumping up in pain, which certainly is not normal, but a good pelvic floor, once it's diagnosed, a good pelvic floor physical therapist can help cure that. So that's why we work collaboratively as a team. Um, I mean, I think a good pelvic floor physical therapist is weight their, worth their weight in gold and I've never had a patient disappointed that they went. And interestingly, now that we're all sitting in front of these Zoom type meetings, we're seeing a lot more pelvic floor function just from people running their office workday from their kitchen, getting up and interacting in the office. Um, so it might be something simpler than you realize and you really should bring it up. Great. And do you think that um, some of this, these disorders with pain have to do with lubrication, moisture issues? Because a lot of the questions that have come in have to do with, is there something I can rub in my vagina? Is there a pellet that can be put in my arm or my butt to help with um, uh, sexual health? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so those are um, very, very different treatment options. But th so the one thing that I think is really important to know, getting back to what's normal and what not, what's not, about 75% of women, so if there's about 10 of us in a room, seven to eight of us will not get reliably wet when we are turned on. And that's actually something very, very important to bring on because then women start saying, wait a minute, I thought I was turned on, well, what's wrong? And then the partner is feeling maybe embarrassed, saying, what's wrong with you? You're not attracted to me anymore. But just knowing that vaginal dryness is normal, even for healthy 18-year-olds, and that's why there's lots of good lubricants out there. So um, some of the lubricants that are available over the counter may be um, a little bit more irritating to women who have very sensitive skin. Um, so some of the silicone-based ones are some of my favorites. They last longer. Um, they do better in water. You just can't use it together with a silicone 
on sex toy because it can actually be hard to clean and it can degrade the surface over time. But a good lubricant can go a long way for dryness related symptoms and also normalizing the dryness is very important. Now, when it comes to hormones, pellets we usually do not recommend. Um, pellets uh, give very, very high high doses of hormones and once it's in, it's in. So we do see, I know at some wellness clinics, those are popular um, and there may be a handful of women that have good success with them, but we do see a lot of balding hair, terrible acne, you know, feeling very irritable, sky high male level hormones, but we do do a lot of hormonal treatments, whether that be via pill, via rubbing something on the vagina and other treatment options, but that does get more into specific treatment options. Okay, excellent. And I also want to just ask um, again with Dr. Pruitt at this point, you know, a lot of women have talk with Dr. Batur um, and talk about uh, moisture and maybe she's prescribed therapy for them. But several women have written in, have asked about this issue of physical intimacy. You know, they wanna feel close to their partner, but does mm -hmm. it always have to be tied with sex? And what do we say to women who then have to speak with their partner about mm -hmm. closeness, intimacy versus the actual act of intercourse? Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. So oftentimes um, when people think of intimacy, they tend to think of the sexual intercourse part of it. And they don't think that there is there's actually a scale of intimacy from emotional to sexual intercourse. And there's a lot in between. And so there are ways you could be physically close with your partner without it involving sexual um, intercourse. So some of it is just going back to the basics. When you were first dating, you know, uh, there's this honeymoon period that people often go through. They're holding hands, they're hugging they're kissing. Um, so those are ways that you could be um, physically close to your partner. Sometimes it's just sitting together on the couch watching your favorite show. Um, you know, just, just to share some personal information, my, my husband and I, we tend to sit on opposite sides of the couch sometimes. And so you just kind of get used to being in your personal space. Um, but one way to be closer is actually move closer to one another. Um, you know, sometimes we, you know, experience a lack of closeness and we're not open with our partners about how we feel. So sometimes it does just take communicating to your partner, oh, I miss when we would kiss like this, or I miss holding hands. So sometimes it's just opening up and communicating to your partner the things that you miss rather than accusing them of not being attracted to you anymore. So it's really just approaching it more, um, I guess you would say from more of a vulnerable side um, rather than saying, do you not find me attractive anymore or what's wrong with me? Just, I miss this, can we hold hands? So that's one way to also have um, physical closeness. Excellent. You know, Dr. Pator takes care of lots of patients and she can, prescribe hormone therapy or check hormones potentially. And a patient might say, you know, Dr. Pratur, I, I'm interested in my husband or partner. Um, I shouldn't always say husband, but there's could be male or female partners, um, marriage or not marriage. And my relationship would probably be a better way to say this. I feel moist. Um, I'm interested in, in intercourse, but still there's something missing. So with Dr. Pruitt, is there such a thing as sexual incompatibility? If so, what does that look like? I mean, you have all the things lined up correctly, but something's still not happening. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that, and then I'll get back with Dr. Batur for a few more questions. So when I think about that, I, I would say it could be timing. You know, I think Dr. Batur mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes uh, with women, it might just be the response time. Um, and so it could be, I don't know if I would call it necessarily sexual incompatibility, um, but it just may not be the timing. Maybe you don't feel close at that moment. Um, you know, for some couples, when I speak to them about intimacy, it could be maybe there's an issue with trust in the relationship. Um, maybe you haven't communicated what your needs are or what you actually like um, sexually. So oftentimes you'll find couples don't actually talk about what they like. Um, you know, they just kind of go by what their experience has been. Um, you have some people who have, you know, more experience than their partner does. And so um, they may not know what they like. Um, and so some of it is actually, you know, being open to doing some exp exploration, but also is this the right time? Do we need to talk more and figure out what do we both like um, to actually figure out how to make the couple, you know, how the couple can be more compatible. So do you give your patients homework assignments, Dr. Pruitt? 
and mm -hmm. what might the homework assignment look like for someone mm -hmm. that's having, um, I'm not sure if I'm using the right term, but the sexual incompatibility, mm -hmm. being able to be interested in intercourse, what would that homework assignment be, be like? Mm -hmm. and what do you have in the practice? Yeah, so there's um, this, this type of way of being intimate called sensate focus, where the focus is actually not on um, sexually pleasing your partner. So it takes away the expectation of sexual performance. And it's actually focused on both partners being able to explore one another through touch. And so um, you can make it as intimate as you'd like. Sometimes I tell couples, you know, f find a babysitter if you've got young kids. If not, you know, dim the lights, have candles, you know, just something to, to set the mood to, to feel you know, more and more romantic and, and uh, hopefully lead to that compatibility. Um, but again, the focus is not on sex. It's more about just exploring your partner through touch and then vice versa. So, um, for example, each of you may take 10 minutes just to actually just touch your partner in different places. Um, and then be mindful about what feels good to you as the person who's touching. And then if you're the one being touched, what feels good like what areas do you like being touched and what areas maybe not so much and then afterwards communicate what that experience was like now i will say that when i give uh, couples this assignment sometimes it does lead to sexual intimacy but again that's not the focus of it um, for some couples especially those who haven't maybe had sex in years uh, doing this particular exercise actually could be intimidating um, so this is a good way to also just practice being physically close to your partner again and, and figuring out what you like and what they like. Excellent, excellent. So Dr. Pator, if someone's done the homework assignments that Dr. Pruitt has suggested, and maybe they didn't get an A on their homework, um, and they're not doing very well week after week with the therapy that they're getting, at what point, if any, do you check hormone levels? I mean, patients come to us you know, saying they're having sexual problems. When does hormones, uh, levels, blood work, or saliva tests, I'm not sure which one's right to do. When do you do it? Does it need to be do, uh, done? And then how might medications help um, with this? And I'm happy to dive into that big question, but one thing, can I please state how important it is to continue to work with somebody amazing like Dr. Pruitt? Um, because I think a lot of what I would do is I would actually go back to that patient as to why things aren't working out. I mean, for uh, for women, the vast majority of the time, you know, our sexual, our libido center comes from between our ears, not below our waist. And I think women tend to have, I shouldn't say women, in gen individuals in general tend to have such a hang up over seeing a behavioral health therapist where for sexual health, that can be such an important aspect. Um, I mean, I've been at the Cleveland Clinic since 1998, and I'm such a big believer in the mind-body connection more now than I ever was as a young medical student coming here. Um, and so I think the first thing I would say is, you know, why didn't it go well? I mean, did they just only go to one or two sessions, uh, you know, with her, one of her colleagues, and then just gave up? Um, because, you know, I feel like I have to work collaboratively. It's not all about the treatments, because the treatments give women a nudge in the right direction. Um, but if I had something that would take a stressed out, uh, you know, mom, working mom that's frustrated with their partner and may turn them into a sex vixen on and off, you know, certainly I would be prescribing that from my Caribbean island. You know, <laughs> that just does not exist. And I wouldn't be spending, you know, sometimes close to an hour with the patient in the room. Um, so I can't emphasize enough how important the mind work is in all of this, in addition to the hormones. But if, you know, in terms of hormone testing, some common sense prevails here. If a woman is having fantasies about um, her a partner, a male or female that's not her partner, but not interested in having sex with her partner, then we probably don't need you know a thousand dollars worth of hormone testing. If somebody is you know having regular menstrual cycles and is interested in um, masturbating uh, uh, several times a month on her own, but not interested in having sex with her partner, we probably don't need a thousand dollars worth of hormone testing. Um, I'm always happy to order tests that you know women feel like they need, but I do like to have the conversation because I don't want women paying out of pocket for things that they really don't need if, if things seem to be okay but that being said there are hormonal issues that we do pick up um, and especially if there's menstrual irregularities it could be very uh, appropriate 
for women going through perimenopause or menopause, especially women going through early menopause or premature menopause, if you're 36 and you had your ovaries removed for whatever reason, then we definitely um, should consider something hormonal until the average age of menopause um, because there the hormones may certainly be a huge factor and you know menopausal hormone therapy for 20 years people were very nervous about it initial studies that suggested harm and now even the American Heart Association who's been dragging its feet all along says you know we can't deny it the data is good for the average you know healthy woman in her 50s hormone therapy is probably just fine if she has reasons for it so we have a lot of treatment options, both hormonal and non-hormonal. But the first thing to decide is, you know, does this sound hormonal? Do you need all the testing? And then we take it from there. Excellent. And I'll come back with you to uh, dig a little bit deeper about what we might do in those patients who have breast cancer, blood clots, things where they might not take it. But let me pivot again to Dr. Pruitt, keeping in the same thought. You know, we're talking about relationships today, and many women are reading these books about love languages. Um, are your patients coming to you about the book? Um, what, what are the different uh, five, I think it's five languages or several language, love languages. Tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about it, and should our patients pick up the book, and what is it? And kind of go through that, because it sounds like some of the things that Dr. Batur is talking about that mm -hmm working with someone like her or another physician and the communication issue and learning about this mm -hmm. love language. Let's bring these both together a little bit more. So tell me more. Sure. Um, so I love talking about the love language with languages with couples. Um, so there are five love languages. Uh, this was created by Dr. Gary Chapman. Um, there is a book um, and it's even expanded to um, understanding languages with your kids. But we're not talking about the kids today. We're talking about the couples, right? So um, there are, like I said, five love languages. And, and the languages really are about understanding how you feel cared for in your relationship and how your partner feels cared for in the relationship. Um, so the first love language is called words of affirmation. So for some people, they really feel cared for in their relationship when their partner uh, compliments them or tells them, you know, that they appreciate them. Um, so for some people, that goes a long way to feel cared for in the relationship. Um, the next one is acts of service. So acts of service is those things that you might do for your partner. Um, it might be something as simple as taking the garbage out or washing the dishes or doing laundry, but it's some type of service that communicates to your partner that you care about them because you're willing to take this task on. Um, and maybe it's something that they typically would do. Um, you know, a lot of couples have uh, split roles in the home. And so maybe um, that particular role was something that the other partner decided to pick up, but that was something meaningful um, that the other person noticed, especially if acts of service is their love language. Um, the next one is physical touch. And so physical touch, again, doesn't mean that it has to be sexual. It just means this closeness. So you feel cared for in your relationship when you're physically close to your partner. So I mentioned earlier, holding hands, kissing, it could be just sitting next to each other on the couch. So um, there's, there's not this grand gesture. It doesn't have to be this big thing. It's just you are literally close to that person and that helps you feel cared for. Um, the next one is receiving gifts. So for some people, they really like to receive gifts and that's how they feel cared for. Um, and it's not about receiving these material gifts or um, these very extravagant gifts. It may be that you have a favorite uh, latte that you enjoy and your partner knows that and maybe they surprise you, you know, with your favorite, you know, coffee drink. And so, um, again, doesn't have to be anything extravagant. Um, and then the last one is quality time. So quality time is actually spending time, focused time, intentional time with your partner and joins an activity. Um, and so, you know, with those love languages, oftentimes we communicate to our partner the way that we feel cared for. So for example, if quality time is the way that I feel cared for in my relationship, I'm going to approach my partner with, let's do this activity together. Whereas maybe, you know, your partner's love of language is receiving gifts. So it's not that they don't appreciate, you know, spending time with you, but maybe if you just get them a little something Are that you know. To get her? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Their favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Their favorite thing. Then maybe, um, you know, that's something that will get you a platinum star instead of a gold star. So, so love languages is really just a way to communicate that you care 
about your partner, that you see them, um, and it helps you, again, to build that emotional and physical closeness. What's, those are great. Um, you said there's, there were five of them I was trying yes. to keep. Mm -hmm. And what's the name of the book and the author? And we'll also um, yes. try to upload this on our website so that we can okay. include this as a resource. But just say the name one more time in case someone wants to jot it down. And the author, please. Right. The five love languages and the author is Gary Chapman, C-H-A-P-M-A-N. Thank you so, so much. And mm -hmm. while I've got you, let me ask you this. Some, um, some patients, and I see them in my practice, and it is sad in terms of, and very sobering in terms of the number of women that have been in a toxic relationship with issues as it has to do with incest or rape, um, emotional, verbal, physical abuse. Um, can you tell me how you help women with those situations? Um, not so much the situation, but sort of what happens after those situations in terms of sex, sexuality. What kinds of things do you see in your, in your practice that women might come to you with what kinds of complaints if they've been in a toxic relationship? And then mm -hmm. what type of advice do we have? And because I've often found as a gynecologist that some of the sexual dysfunction that we see um, mm -hmm. has to do with what happened to girls when they were little, mm -hmm. um, um, teenagers, adolescents. Um, the stories that I've had people share after 50 years where they've been hurt or injured, it's pretty devastating. So my mm -hmm. question is, we all know the numbers um, in terms of how many women are affected by this, but what do the women come to you saying? And mm -hmm. then how do you help them so that we mm -hmm. can all sort of be listening when patients come in? So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I probably see more of this in my, you know, my practice with individuals. So unfortunately, I do see a lot of women who have experienced um, multiple traumas and may have started when they were young. Um, like you said, whether incest or some type of um, other sexual abuse or sexual assault. Um, you know, a lot of times it, it could be from a family member or neighbor, uh, somebody who was trusted in the family. But unfortunately, that trauma, um, oftentimes they felt like they could not share that with anyone. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes these women feel isolated and alone. Um, they feel like they're the only ones who have gone through this. Um, and then what tends to happen, at least from what I've seen, is that either I'm hearing women that don't want to engage in sexual intercourse at all, or when they do, um, they never feel comfortable in their relationship. They have a lot of difficulty trusting other people um, because they just don't know if they're going to be used. Um, unfortunately, um, kids who've been abused um, are at risk of, of being victims of additional trauma. So you just have like this, this trauma that complicates. But typically what I see in, as far as seeing relationships is this lack of trust um, and this difficulty being intimate with their partners because unfortunately they were exposed um, in a violent way so early and really don't know what a healthy relationship sh should look like. Yeah, thank you so much. And with Dr. Batur, when we look at what we do in the office, taking our vital signs, the weight, the blood pressure, sometimes our waist measurement, our height, um, one of the other vital signs that's been, I think it's called the fifth or the sixth vital signs is the issue with safety. And to sort of piggyback onto what Dr. Pruitt um, just mentioned, do you ask your patients, um, I won't say every visit, but at least now and then about their personal safety um, before you would start a visit that has to do with sexual dysfunction or is that included somewhere? Yes, um, we do uh, routinely ask um, our patients about feeling safe at home. And um, if a woman hasn't felt comfortable to, because usually the nurses ask first. Um, and then when I'm doing a sexual health questionnaire, I do ask, you know, um, I do ask about sexual trauma. Um, but I think if you don't, it's really important to bring it up uh, bring it up and then we can walk through it. There's no one size fits all answers to any of these complex situations, but please, please do bring it up. The one thing I do wanna make sure um, our audience knows is that when I had mentioned before the um, what we call discordance between the genitalia and the brain, um, when it comes to rape and abuse, um, incest, child abuse, any of that, 
one thing I want our um, listeners to know is that there are a lot of times women who may orgasm or get wet during one of those situations. And that brings a lot of shame where they do not want to bring this up. And the whole concept of genital discordance is, you know, you're there's a biological function of your genitalia where a man may get an erection, a woman may get, or even orgasm in inappropriate situations. And that's just because the genitalia thinks there's some biological clue of sexual activity and responding as it should, even though in your brain, you know, this is not appropriate. And I can't tell you the number of times when I've explained this, or I've talked about this, you know, in lectures, I've had people come up to me and say, thank you. I've been harboring shame for 20 years because, you know, I, I was, raped um, and I orgasmed and I th and I was so confused I thought there was something wrong with me I thought I was you know part of the problem and of course they've been medicating themselves whether it be with alcohol with food or toxic relationships because of that shame so don't be embarrassed to bring this up chances are somebody like Dr. Pruitt myself have heard this and had this conversation with multiple people that week so it really is I mean if we fail to ask you please bring it up I mean it's important that being said, there's a lot of women. Unfortunately, sexual trauma is so common. Um, it just, regardless of your race, your ethnicity, how much money you have, what country you live in. And um, it's also one of my pet peeves to always assume, you know, I always tell trainees, just because there's a history of abuse, that woman may have worked through it in a healthy relationship. So don't abuse, don't assume that her current problems are related to that abuse, unless, you know, we dig deeper and she feels it, it's probably related. Excellent. Do you, with a story like that, that you just mentioned, uh, would you often make a referral to someone like a Dr. Pruitt or another therapist to help work through some of these issues that may have happened days ago or years ago? Absolutely. I mean, I try to stay in my lane. I, I'm the MD that tinkers with the medications and trying to do the diagnostics, but it's somebody like Dr. Pruitt that has the training to dig a little bit deeper um, into the, you know, I don't have that psychological training. I'm just there to try to identify it. So it's really important that we work as a team and that women don't get past the hang up. Oh, well, you know, why do you think I need to go to that? Do you think I'm crazy? No, I think we all could use somebody to talk to, frankly. And the one other thing, this is even important for men because I've um, you know ran into situations where um, we, when we talked to couples a man for example had an erection when he was at a frat house and he saw somebody being raped and he had an erection and he felt oh well maybe this isn't bad so instead of going to get help or interrupt the process he thinks okay maybe this isn't so bad after all so it's really important to not put so much weight on what the vagina or the penis is doing and um you know just kind of talk these things out with somebody who can guide you through it in a healthy way excellent so let me ask dr pruitt really quickly here mm -hmm. the information that shared with us this uh with you or even with us in terms of the intimacy of these personal situations mm -hmm. pa patients often want to know does someone else read my chart is there privacy does the insurance company know? Can you just tell us what your obligations are and how those records with therapy are either sheltered, unsheltered, able to be mm -hmm. opened up? Tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about that because I've had patients feel that, well, every provider from here out will always see X, Y, or Z that's happened to me. So tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So, you know, it, with every first visit, I always go over confidentiality with patients and let them know, you know, that, yes, I am keeping notes. Um, however, I don't put any additional, I don't put any more information in your chart than is absolutely necessary. Um, but I do talk to them about the limits of confidentiality. So if I felt that they, um, you know, were at risk of harming themselves or someone else, I would have to let someone know, or if it's related to child abuse or neglect or elder abuse or someone with disability. So I always let them know about confidentiality from the very beginning and what those limits are. Um, I do share with them that yes, I keep notes in your chart. Uh, when I am working with couples, um, you know, because it's two people, I let them know that the notes that I'm keeping is in the person who's considered like the identified patient. So whoever, you know, initiated that referral process, that's where the notes are going. However, if I know that uh, both partners are, are patients of Cleveland Clinic, I'll also let them know that, you know, it's, it, it, you know, there might be some situations where I may put a notation 
in your chart, but it's usually due to communication or if there's some information that you've shared in therapy that could be helpful for another one of your providers. Um, but I let them know that um, the people, one, no one should be looking at your chart unless they are one of, you know, unless you are one of their patients. And that if anyone is looking in your chart at my notes is to coordinate, you know, therapy. So maybe they're reviewing my notes because I've referred them to that particular provider. And so they're reviewing to see what we worked on. But I try to give them, you know, confidence in knowing that no, uh, insurance providers are not looking at, you know, your notes. Um, they may need to look at your diagnosis for billing purposes, but they're not looking at what I'm writing in your chart and not everyone has access to what it is that I'm putting in your chart. I think it's very helpful and thank for sharing that mm -hmm. um, and being very transparent about what we're doing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Vitor, I think you mentioned about having a house in the Caribbean potentially, <laughs> and I would say I could have a house in the Caribbean too for every, if I had a dollar for every patient in my career that asked about what can they do about increasing their libido, their sex drive, their interest, their stamina, whatever the word is gonna be. I, I too could maybe have a house next to yours uh, in the Caribbean <laughs> because it's a big question that, that's asked. So let's kind of like break it down as simply as we can in terms of what is libido, can we get it, can we get it back? <laughs> and is there anything that, that you, or and then also Dr. Pruitt to think about it that we can do? So let's elaborate that, because that's the part of this pillow talk. Everybody's talking about their sex drive. And I'll kind of bridge this by saying, you know, there was a, there's pills for men. Um, we know what they are, the little blue pill, and we can talk about the little pink pill that was to come out for women. But let's just put a dump everything together about libido what you need to know, how to get it, how to get it back. So tell me more. Absolutely. So um, big question. <laughs> um, simplified answer is um, first, you're asking about what we call hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So uh, everything else is okay. There's nothing medically wrong that, that should explain this, but I just don't want to have sex. I'm not responding to erotic cues. And for it to truly be a disorder, you know, the, diagno the criteria are that it should last about six months and be distressing to the woman, not just that, you know, your partner wants to have sex six times a week and you only want to have sex once every 10 days. I mean, that's just discordance there. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Um, but assuming that you really are bothered by your decrease in libido, we have hormonal and non-hormonal options. Um, uh, I'm not a big believer in, you know, chemical warfare. So if you're on medications that may be impacting libido, we're going to look through that first because there might be other alternative medications that may not um, impact your libido as negatively. But assuming that's not the case, we have two FDA approved options that are for premenopausal women, but in all fairness, it does work in postmenopausal women as well. It's just postmenopausal women, it's probably not going to be covered by insurance and they're going to have to pay out of pocket. And one is a medication that you would take nightly and it has sedating effects, which um, for women who are having trouble with sleep, it could be a very nice side effect. Um, and then that one is taken every night to actually boost libido. And then there's also an injection that you do. Um, about for, uh, separately a different medication that you could do about an hour, 45 minutes prior to, uh, um, to sex to make that better. Um, and injection, I mean, nobody wants to do injections, but it's the, one of those hair-like needles. So there's nobody in any of the studies or my patients that complained because it was an injection. It's one of those tiny, tiny needles that doesn't hurt. Um, but these are options. Um, and then we do have hormone replacement therapy, both estrogen and testosterone. So Testosterone is not FDA approved, but there, it is guideline approved, which means there's a lot of data, safety data surrounding it. And so multiple gynecologic and endocrine societies have recommended it's okay to try it. But you have to, the caveat is that you have to kind of follow the levels um, and because there's no FDA approved way to do it. So we're either compounding it or using one tenth of male doses. So it's not a clean and easy thing. It requires a lot of follow up with your provider. And as long as you're sticking to physiologic doses, we're not giving toxic levels to women. And that's very important because if I do see women coming in who've had mega, mega doses of testosterone prescribed to them and their libido didn't budge, then we know we're barking up the right tree and it's 
it's probably not just the hormones that's going to impact. Um, that's, you know, the most effective therapies. People go to supplements and things. Um, I have to be, I always say I'm leery of anything that's unregulated that a businessman or businesswoman is directly marketing to you where there's nobody watching over it, especially the ones that they say for weight loss, libido, um, energy. Those are some of the ones that have the most impurities in them. So there's nothing that I know of great studies that have been looked at with the natural supplements. Um, and then um, we do do other things like there's creams that you can, we can compound that are like a, a helps bring blood supply to the clitoris that are non-hormonal um, that don't work wonders, but again, can give you push in the right direction. And even simple things uh, study, that have been studied, you know, having sex three times a week, at least painless sex regularly seems to kind of kickstart your own hormones. And doing a really good kick butt workout um, about 30 minutes before you're going to exercise, kickboxing, aerobics, something that's going to get your blood revving up may make your you know, you know sex uh, life better the 30 minutes after, which makes sense, right? Because you've started to get the blood supply down in the area. So oftentimes it's just a combination depending on how bothered a woman by it, by it, it by the you know by the problems and what they want to try, whether they want to try more natural approaches, whether they want to try the medication whether they want to try everything in combination. But we, we do have a lot to offer. Great. You know, I also would want to mention as a surgeon, we do offer in office, you know, the laser therapy, sometimes also for vaginal dryness. That might be a good option for the women I was going to ask you about who have breast cancer, breast disease, or can't take hormone therapies. Besides the potential laser therapies, which are fairly painless that we offer, are there other things for the women that cannot take hormone therapy? Our breast cancer yeah. survivors, those kinds of things for libido. Right. So the non-hormonal options that I was mentioning, the injection, the pills, there are there are one or two um, antidepressants that we use off-label, meaning like it's not FDA approved for that, but they can give a boost libido. Um, so those kind of non-hormonal options are open to our breast cancer survivors. We do the laser therapy. And actually, if there's a lot of dryness, um, we do work with the oncology team closely where we can use very microscopic doses of the vaginal hormones to treat dryness. Um, in fact, the Mayo Clinic Women's Health Group and us, we did write an article about how to do this safely because I do find in our breast cancer survivors, people sometimes are either told, no, you have no options whatsoever. You know, you, you're going to have some women have such terrible lack of estrogen changes um, that they're told, no, you can't do anything. Or other times people are willy nilly being prescribed heavy doses that can get to the breast. So there is a truth halfway in between. And we do work with the oncology teams to sometimes offer very minuscule doses that sit vaginally that are not absorbed systemically. So women do a little less options for our um, hormone sensitive cancer survivors, but they still have options. Okay, perfect. Let me ask Dr. Pruitt um, a question about therapy because you talked about couples. So if someone is in a coupled relationship, but one member of that couple does not want to participate, does the individual um, the woman, because we're speaking to women today, should she still come? Or what if she says, I really would like my partner to come, but he or she won't come? Mm -hmm. does, does therapy work for just the individual when we have someone that's a naysayer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And actually, that situation does come up. Uh, so we never want to do couples therapy in a situation where one person is motivated and committed to the process and the other person isn't. So um, I would not recommend, you know, trying to force someone to do couples therapy. Um, however, if if the you know the female partner or or, um, or the one partner is actually interested you know in doing some type of individual therapy i would still recommend it depending on what the situation is so um yeah i work with a lot of couples but I also work with a lot of individuals um, who are coming in with relationship concerns and so um and there's been times where maybe a couple has come in um and maybe their relationship was a little rocky already or there was less commitment on one person's end than the other um sometimes those those patients, you know, the person who's been motivated and committed kind of turns into an individual patient and I still work with them related to whatever the concerns are that they have. Um, whether it's the relationship issues or maybe it's depression and anxiety or maybe it's a, a past trauma that they're trying to work through. So um, I would still recommend, you know, some type of therapy depending on what their hopes are. But um, if 
their partner does not want to engage in couples therapy, then it wouldn't be helpful for either one of them. Okay, that's very, very helpful. And let me ask Dr. Batur, you know, we're speaking about women today. Some women have no partners by choice, by circumstance with death, divorce, uh, separation, but still want to feel sexual. Let's talk, if we could, about how these women may feel. Some women feel guilty with masturbation, our use of vibrators, our self-stimulation. Can you talk um, with us briefly just about the use of self-pleasure and vibra vibrators and self-care in terms of sexuality? How do you talk to your patients about that? I'm so glad you brought this up because there's um, there's you know, there's a lot of embarrassment around this topic. But if you look at the most recent studies, um, up to 80% of women um, report bringing some sort of a vibrator or device into the bedroom um, at at some point. So it's really more the norm anymore, and that's why you can go to your local whatever Walgreens, CVS pharmacy and find vibrators right next to the um, lubricants. Um, so there are multiple, multiple types of vibrators. And sometimes when people come in the office, I kind of give them the, some of the fan favorites, best ofs. Um, but it can actually take a few, sometimes it's a little bit of a monetary uh, investment to find what's best for you. Um, what is perfect and some one person loves may not fit with another person's anatomy. But in general, it takes direct clitoral stimulation for the vast majority of women. It takes direct clitoral stimulation to bring them to orgasm. The vast majority majority of women do not orgasm with something inserted into the vagina. It's a very small percentage that do. Um, but for many women, having both a, something stimulating the G-spot internally and the direct clitoral stimulation can bring them to orgasm faster. So technology has come a long way. It can be hard for man or woman to keep up with machine. So I would encourage everyone to kind of feel empowered um, to get to know their body, what's best for their body. I've had women not reach their maximum orgasm potential, not recognize that they can have multiple orgasm until their mid 60s. So that's a lot of years lost. You know, um, there's great books written about orgasm potential that date back into the 70s and are still good um, and accurate today. So it's your body, you know, feel empowered. Lots of women are masturbating, even if they're not talking about, and there's lots of tools to help women. It's a big business to actually help um, women to have a better sex life. That's perfect. Let me ask each of you in closing now, maybe give me, uh, Dr. Pruitt, three things you want women uh, and our viewers to take away from today's Pillow Talk that will mm -hmm. uh, give them improvement in their sexuality uh, in their relationships and their intimacy. Mm -hmm. What's your sure. takeaways? Sure, I would say maybe the first one is uh, remember why you were attracted to your partner in the first place. Um, you know, you might have to, if things have gotten a little bland or uh, routine, uh, remind yourself about what attracted you to your partner, um, you know, and maybe start bringing some of that back. So if it was taking walks um, or just having long talks, um, checking in about each other's day or just not talking about anything, um, you know, see if you can actually reintroduce that back into your relationship. Um, Another thing is flirt with your partner. So again, you know, things might have become a little mundane, um, you know, getting into the routine. And so having little communications throughout the day to let your partner know that you think they're attractive, that um, maybe you do want, you know, to have sex later, or maybe you just want to, you know, cuddle. Um, but, but just letting them know, you know, what you think about them and how you feel about them, but just sending little messages throughout the day. So maybe just not communicating about, you know, remembering that your child has a soccer game, you know, this evening, but hey, you know, you look pretty good this morning when you left for work or, you know, I've been thinking about you all day. Maybe we can find some time to, to, to hook up later tonight, you know, so, so just, you know, make it fun. So I think just bringing back that fun. Um, and then the other thing is just the communication. So being able to um, communicate your thoughts, your feelings, uh, what brings people closer in their relationship is not just sharing all the good stuff, it's being able to, to share the vulnerability as well. And so being able to communicate that 
Um, and, and communicate your needs too, you know, being able to say like, you know, I liked it when you did this, you know, or when you know, the last time we had sex, I remember you did this and, and can we do that again? Or, um, you know, I really enjoyed this and I saw that you liked my reaction, you know, Hey, you know, can, can we think about this? So I think just opening up those lines of communication and being honest and open about what it is that you're thinking and feeling, um, is something that I would want, um, our viewers to take away from today. Excellent. And also for you, Dr. Batur, let me ask you in closing, sort of three takeaways you'd like for our audience today. Um, the, one of the biggest things is to speak up. I mean, these concerns that you have are much more common than you realize. And realistically, multiple of your neighbors probably have contemplated reviewing this with their doctor too. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I think feel empowered to get more information, um, whether it's about self-stimulation, what's normal, what are the medication treatment options. Um, just recognize though, it does take some time to sort through. If you've you know felt your libido is down in the dumps for 10 years, I don't think it's fair that, uh, you know, your gynecologist is going to be able to sort through it in five minutes while also doing your pap tests and, you know, talking to you about heavy bleeding uh, and contraception. So don't be, don't be put off by the fact that it's not being blown off, but you do need to really spend some time with somebody to get to the bottom of things. And I would just say buyer beware. I mean, there's a lot, we, this is, there's, we know there's a lot of women out there suffering in silence. So lots of people trying to make a buck, you know, trying to sell the next supplement and that has completely untested. So there are lots of folks who have really gone through the trouble of testing medications to make sure that they do work better than a placebo, you know, a tic tac. Um, that's given as a fake pill, um, that they're actually effective, that they're safe. And so, you know, I, just because something is touted as a natural supplement, I'm not sure that we should just jump to that assuming it's safe because we don't oftentimes know what's in it or if there's even anything in it. And oftentimes those things cost just as much as medication. So if you are thinking about treatment, make sure you're going to somebody who knows what they're doing, not somebody who's making a buck off of selling you supplements. Perfect. So I just wanna I just wanna thank you, Dr. Pretour and Dr. Pruitt for a really robust and great discussion. You have shared valuable information about the physical and mental aspects of women's sexual health. Just a reminder to all of our viewers, this event was pre-recorded and you can view any part of the program again online at clevelandclinic.org forward slash celebrate sisterhood. Feel free to share this with other family members, friends, and colleagues.